and go ahead and uh, join me in the book of Acts. I'll be in Acts chapter 2 in just a moment, and we want to say hey to those of you that are joining us online today, and uh, we're grateful for you uh, spending part of your morning here with us, and uh, so if you could get yourself over to Acts 2, that'd be really, really helpful. And um, uh, I don't know how you feel about vacations, but I love vacations, uh, and I like road trips. Anybody like road trips? I know, I know flying gets us there quicker. I totally get that. Uh, but man, sometimes a good road trip is just what the soul needs. And when we were coming uh, late last summer, we were coming from Arizona uh, to Ohio. It was a road trip, y'all. I mean, a road trip of all road trips. And so we had you know, six of us piled in our SUV and uh, the West Coast behind us and the East Coast in the Midwest in front of us. And one of the best things about road trips uh, are the playlists. Can I get a witness, man? The, the music is just phenomenal. Now, one of the parts that's super funny about this trip for us was that we, uh, I kid you not, and uh, you can ask my wife and my oldest daughter's in the room right now afterwards if you think I'm lying. I am not lying. I would never lie to you. And uh, we're in the car and there's a particular moment where all of us are dialed in, I mean, to the top of our lungs. Every person in the car from Roman, the three-year-old, to now me, I was 36 at the time, 37 as of this last week, uh, but uh, 36, all of us in the car were blaring as loud as we could, the greatest showman. It was awesome. It was super, super fun. And at, at, towards the end of this song, what was really funny uh, is that the song just stopped and everybody's like, Dad, what did you do? As if that was my fault, uh, but it wasn't necessarily my fault. And Roman, our three-year-old, he figured out what it was and he calls it buffering. <laughs> it's buffering, it's buffering. And you heard this, you like the, the smack on the head, ah, buffering. And Roman is sitting there and he's frustrated because the network got bogged down. I mean, we, were, we went from a good network to a bad network uh, in, yeah, I don't know, several hundred feet, maybe a quarter mile. And uh, maybe you've experienced that before too when you're driving and you're on a road trip and you didn't download the playlist. And so you're pulling from data. And so you're driving and then it's at that really awesome part of the song and the bottom falls out and now you've got nothing. And I actually did a little research on this uh, with, as far as regarding to networks. What happens when you uh, move from a good network to a not so good network, like you go to like 3G, basically all you can do on a 3G network in the middle of nowhere is basically call 911. That's about all you can do. There is no text messaging. Uh, there are no phone calls. Listen, I've driven across the country so many times in my life, it's ridiculous. I don't even know how many times I've done it now. I've lost count. And there are all these spots where, man, you're going well and everything's great and then the network falls out. And what happens is like your Spotify playlist is bogging down that 3G network and it's hit the ceiling and the network can't do any more. It can't do anything else. So it just stops all functioning of your mobile device. I'm sure many of us have been pretty frustrated and regret some of the things we've said when that has happened in the car before because you don't know where to navigate. You don't know where you're going. And then what's beautiful is then you get back onto the 4G network LTE coverage. What happens? The playlist kicks back in. You can check Facebook. You can upload a photo to Instagram. You can check out where the next gas station is. And your kids in the backseat can also stream Netflix while you're listening to a Spotify playlist. And what happens is 4G really takes your experience mobily to a whole nother level. And what I would like to put before us is actually there is a 4G spiritual network that you can tap into uh, that will take your spiritual experience to a whole nother level as well. And really what we've done over the last several weeks here in this series, Built to Last, uh, this will be the eighth week. Can you guys believe that? The eighth week here. And uh, we have built uh, what I like to call a theological framework. That was our very first three weeks where we talked about the, the thing in every human's heart is this universal longing for more. And it's really a theological term called transcendence. And the way in which that is met in the heart of a person 
person is, uh, it's called glory. Uh, and more specifically, it's called God's manifest presence. And you have just experienced some of that in what we just have experienced in worship and we're continuing to do now. And we believe God can do this every week and we seek it, we pray for it, and we long for God to do that in our church. And so we rallied around a theological framework. You didn't know that's what you were doing, uh, but that's what we were doing so that we could all have a language to rally around and move forward with. Well, then we turned a corner and embraced not just a theological framework, but we, uh, we kind of developed these philosophical anchors. So you have a theological framework. It starts with a head and it's heady. And then uh, you get into these philosophical anchors. And we talked about uh, you know, this idea of passionate worship and uh, the unapologetic preaching of God's word. And we talked about prayer and it should never stop. And we should pray about everything. And then uh, we talked last week about evangelism. And those are some things, ministry, philosophy, they're anchors for us uh, that build our house and that help us move forward. And today, uh, what we're gonna do is kind of apply all of that and really uh, unpack this concept that I would call 4G and their practical disciple behaviors, practical behaviors of a disciple. And so all of this kind of flows into uh, what you'll hear and you've already heard about, honestly, if you've been with us. Uh, late last year, we did a series called Sweet Spot where we unpacked each of these uh, on, on a specific week. But really, these theological things and these philosophical things all kind of gain momentum and shove us toward a really practical behavior of what it looks like actually to follow Jesus. Now, what you need to know is that we didn't sit in a room and though I love doing this and brainstorming all these particular ideas and I love giant white post-its if you have never used those, they're super fun in meetings and I love writing a bunch of that stuff on a, on a post-it and tearing it down and X marking it and drawn pictures. I love doing that stuff, but uh, we didn't do that for this uh, because it's not new. Everybody say it's not new. So in a world that celebrates the next new thing over and over and over again, I would actually argue your heart doesn't want the next new thing. Your heart wants something anchored in history. You want something that is tried and true and that's been around for a long time. And what I want to give you today is something that's been around since the first century. I wanna give you something that we didn't think of, uh, but really the very first church in the history of the New Testament anchored themselves in these particular things. So basically where we get uh, is Jesus had uh, died on the cross for the forgiveness of sin, for your sin, my sin, for the world's sin. If you embrace him by faith, you receive a savior, you receive forgiveness of sin, and really you see a brand new life in Christ. And he spent 33 years on this earth and he was on top of a particular mountain and he kind of charged, he didn't kind of, he charged his uh, believers and these 12 disciples to go reach the world with the gospel. It's, if you're not new to church, if you're new to church, we call it, it'll be a reminder or a newsflash, a great commission to go reach uh, the people where God has placed you uh, with the message that Jesus is the hope that you're looking for. And that's called the Great Commission found in Matthew 28, 19. And he's called us to do that. And you should go check out last week's sermon if you wanna know more about that. But this is what he did and um, so they had these brand new uh, kind of followers uh, and he charged them with this and they didn't really know what they were doing uh, but what they did do uh, was they were responsive to the Holy Spirit and, they, and they, they were a part of this insane momentum building movement of changing the world with the message of the gospel. Now Peter is one of these guys and he stands up on this day, one particular day in particular with no microphone, with no amplification and thousands of people listening to this man's uh, voice and he preaches the most awe-inspiring message maybe ever recorded in all of the Bible. Maybe actually ever even preached, period, like on the face of the planet. And he preaches the good news of the gospel, telling people that Jesus is the way to hope. He's the forgiveness of sin. And by your faith in him, you can believe in him and you'll receive forgiveness of sin and eternal life in heaven with God forever. And he preaches this powerful message. And we pick up on the tail end of this in Acts chapter two and in verse 37. This is what uh, happens uh, when you preach the gospel. The Bible says in Acts 2.37, when they heard the crowd when they heard this, they were cut 
to the heart. Everybody say cut to the heart. Yeah, they were cut to the heart. Uh, what does that mean? Well, if you have put your faith in Christ before, you have experienced that cut to the heart. It's, oh man, my way isn't working. And that thing just hasn't been working very well. And if you've never put your faith in Christ today, we would pray that you would feel cut to the heart. Uh, not literally, but spiritually, that you would feel that, 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 that sting a little bit of, man, my way hasn't been working and, and I need a new thing. And the new thing is actually Jesus Christ himself. And um, uh, so they were moved deeply is another way to say that by what Christ did for them. And it compelled them to ask, a super reasonable question at the end of verse 37. They asked Peter, uh, the crowd talked back to him, so that's why I like you to talk back to me in the sermon. The crowd talked back to Peter and they asked him a question and they said, brothers, what shall we do? In light of what we've heard, what shall we do uh, with this gospel that you've presented to us? Look at verse 38. Peter tells them what they should do. Verse 38 says, repent, and be baptized. Now for some of us, we, we might not know what repent means because it's not a word we use a lot. It literally is this idea of 180 degrees. If I'm going north, then to repent would be to go south. If I'm going east, to repent would be to go west. It's to make 180 change in a different direction. Now you can't make that change by yourself. It's your expressed faith in Christ that allows you to repent of your sin. Christ draws you to him and then you accept him by faith and that is the process of repentance. And so he says, hey, change your way of thinking. Change your direction. Repent. Turn to Jesus and turn away from yourself. Turn away from what you were doing and turn to Christ and be baptized. And he says, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is what he called these people to do. And after he answered their question and called them to follow Christ, look at what verse 41 says. So those who received his word, was, they were baptized and there were added that day about how many? 3,000 souls. Y'all, that's incredible. That's unbelievable. Another little sidebar sermon for just a moment is this is the same guy that denied Christ three times. And he stood up on a platform by God's grace, not in any effort of, him, uh, of, of his own. And God used a, a broken and fallen and screwed up man to call 3,000 people to faith in Christ. And they were saved and they were added to this brand new church. Now I don't know what would happen if that kind of percentage of people got saved in our church through our city. That would make you drastically have to change some systems and some structures and some things uh, that you would do. And I started asking myself the question about these guys. Hey, what in the world did they do? Now that these 3,000 people came in, surely they had a structure, surely they had a mechanism, surely they had uh, something that they kind of rallied themselves around. Now you have to understand this though. These are fishermen. These are tax collectors. These aren't church planters. They, don't, they didn't go to seminary. They didn't, uh, you know, there were no church planting blogs and books and things out there. They had the rabbi Jesus and he poured three years into them, died for their sin and for the world's sin and now they saw a massive manifestation of his presence and these 3,000 people now were a part of this new family. They had no clue what they were doing. But what did they give themselves to? And I would argue that what they gave themselves to is pretty pertinent for you and for me today a couple of centuries later. Because if it was good enough for the first church, it'd probably be pretty good for us to do too. And so what did they do? Practically what they did and how this applies uh, for you and for me is we're gonna find in Acts 2 in verse 42. Let's look what they did. Verse 42 says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and of the prayers. And all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as, they ha as any had need. Verse 46, and day by day, attending the temple court and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. 
So what does this practically look like for our church? This is kind of where the rubber meets the road. Again, we've talked theology, we've talked philosophy. Let's talk practically what does it look like for us. It starts with this, number one. This is what every believer should do. Number one is gather. You, we should gather, we should prioritize this particular moment right now. That's how you experience glory, transcendence. That's how you experience worship and preaching and the community of believers. It's the priority of gathering. Look at verse 44, and I do apologize. I'd love to go sequentially, verse 42 through the end. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna bounce through that paragraph for just a minute, so you'll have to forgive me. Uh, But verse 44 says, and all, everybody say all, who believed were what? Together, everybody say together. Now verse 46, again, as we're kind of jumping around here, says, and day by day, what did they do? Attend the what? The temple to together and the breaking bread in their homes and they gave themselves to prayer in the homes. So what every believer should do is should prioritize the idea of the gathering of God's people. Like God's people on God's day in God's house. I don't think you can't get any clearer than that. Uh, Man, that's what God wants for you. That's what God wants for me. That's what God wants for us. And what I like to say, and maybe you've heard me say it before, maybe not from this platform, but in other rooms, is that I would encourage you, whether you've been at Sunrise a long time or you're newer to Sunrise, some of us need to recommit and some of us need to commit to the idea of prioritizing coming together as a church on Sunday mornings. Like we need to make this a priority. Uh, Because you spend your week, uh, now my job is not like this, but maybe your job is, you get torn down every week. Aren't you glad my job's not like that? (laughs) You should be glad that my job's not like that. Uh, But some of us in the environments we're in, I mean, you get beat to snot all week long, Monday through uh, Friday, and your boss isn't a Christian, and the people you work with don't necessarily love the Lord. There might be one or two or three, uh, but you're in an environment where uh, it's not easy. Everybody say it's not easy. And that's why you need this. That's why we need God's people to remind us just how good God is in a fallen world when sometimes it feels very, very dark. And so we need this moment week in and week out. That's why the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider how to stir up one another. How do we do that? How do we do it, man? How do we stir one another up? By not neglecting to meet together. Like we need this. We need what we're doing in this moment. Um, And I get it, Sunday should be the preacher's favorite day. Sunday should be Danny's favorite day, okay? We get a pass. And the reason it's not a favorite day is because he stands up here behind a microphone and leads, or because I stand up here and preach to you because it feels like we're a... um, I don't know, uh, uh, you're an audience and we're a performer. I know it feels like that, but it's not like that. Uh, we are facilitators. I'm, I, I'm really a tool. Some of you are like, I know, man, totally. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> sorry. But I'm a tool and Danny's a tool and we are conduits. Maybe I should say I'm more like a PVC pipe. That probably feels better but my job is to just take a, take a current, a spiritual current for that which the Lord has laid on my heart through the word and then be a delivery mechanism for you so that you get spiritual food and so that you get nourished. So, so you're not an audience, you're a participator just like I am. And so we need this and I get Sunday should be my favorite day, but uh, and listen, my family, my kids, uh, they, they love Sunday. Sunday's their favorite day and you know not every pastor's family has that as a reality. You do get that. Not every ministry family uh, grows up in a house uh, where their kids love coming to church. I went to church one time after Joy's dad left our church as a pastor to go on to their, his next ministry post. My, so we became my best friend and his family and the church divisiveness was so bad that uh, his teenage son at one point had all these names of people who were attacking his dad and wrote it on a white t-shirt and then put a giant red X around it and wore that on a Sunday morning to church. Uh, and to this day, that family's probably still wounded by that experience. Now, that's not our church. Praise God for that, but it's not like, it's not like this everywhere. 
It isn't like this everywhere. And so I get that my kids are growing up in, a, in kind of a unique situation where they love he, this place and they love you and you love us. And if you don't love us, you're really good at faking it. Um, but it's not like that everywhere. And I know we should love it, but we want you to love it too. Uh, it goes on later in Ephesians and even in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that we're a body. Everybody say we're a body. Now that's interesting because in our culture we have body image issues. I also think we have body image issues in the church. And so for many of us we have a jacked up perspective on what a body is. And so what you do is what a lot of people do. Hear me say this and I'm treading very lightly, okay? So you're gonna need to be gracious with me. And I don't wanna minimize uh, body image issues and I don't wanna, Im- uh, I don't wanna uh, demoralize or I don't wanna uh, make Um, you know, uh, these image issues into something they're not, but I do believe that some of us, you are starving yourself in the body of Christ by your absence. And then some of you, because you miss, you, you, you gorge yourself with as much as you can quickly, and then you can't handle it anymore, and then you go purge somewhere else. That's a spiritual body image issue. Do I need to go any further? And so I think what we need to do is remember that we are a body and I'm not your head. Everybody say thank God for that. And uh, no pastor is actually your head. Jesus Christ is the head of his church. And so um, if anybody from this platform ever says anything otherwise, mutiny, hardcore. But Jesus Christ is our leader and he's our head and so what we do is we follow him. And so my job is to follow Christ and then call you to follow me as I follow Christ. And so as a body, uh, what's interesting, another analogy, get aside from body image issues, but another side of this is that we're all together in this. And I know that some of you and some of us have a, a kind of a visible role and some of us have microphones and others of us, you know, we're in a prayer closet and nobody knows. Or maybe you serve in a less visible capacity Um, or maybe your gifting is just different than the next person's gifting. And what's interesting is is that some of us might be, um, you know, a visible spot, but other, you know, everybody needs a spleen. Everybody, I don't know what the appendix is for, but everybody's born with one. Uh, Everybody everybody needs lungs. Uh, And what's interesting is, is that if you need a replacement lung, you can get a transplant from another person, even alive. You can get a little bit of the lobe of their lung and put it in your lung, and then you can then begin to survive uh, and your lung will reproduce itself. Liver's kind of the same way. What's interesting about that is that if you choose not to engage in the body, uh, then you're amputating yourself away from what God is united together as one and we're flailing, we're bleeding. So the idea is, is that yes, there are things that come up on Sundays. Can I say this with love because I love you? But the tournament isn't more important than this. And I'm gonna go on vacation. I'm gonna miss two Sundays this year and I'm just gonna tell you that's still, I'm gonna be real with you. That's still not more important, but I do need a break and you do too. But I'm gonna be here another 50 weeks of this year. And you would say that's what we're paying you to do. I would do this if it wasn't that way because this is what I would do if I was in a seat and I sold cars or I sold insurance, I would be here. I would be here 50 weeks out of the year because I need you. And when you choose to disengage from that, you amputate my finger and I'm not functioning like I should. Hey, you amputate me at the knee. When we don't come together and prioritize gathering, we're bleeding. And what happens when you hemorrhage Well, if you hemorrhage for a long time, you die. And I don't want us to, I don't want that to happen to you spiritually. I don't want that to happen to us. And so we've got, I've spent enough time on this, but I think you understand that this early church gave themselves to this. You want to know why? Because they needed it. And I think so much of us don't think we need this. And the other thing is, is probably coming to church doesn't cost us a thing. You'll learn, if you learn church history, you'll learn that these men and these women in the early church, they would literally die for this thing. They would lose their lives for it. So it was a big honking deal. Everybody say it's a big deal. 
Are you catching my drift? Do you think this should be a big deal? I think it should be a big deal. Six of us believe that. It's what every (laughs) believer should do. I've taken more of my time than I wanted to. Number two, uh, grow. It's what every believer wants to be. We want to be growing. I've never met a person that wants to stay four years old, though now at 37, four looks pretty good. (laughs) Four looks pretty good. If all I had to worry about was wild crats and marshmallow cereal, that'd be pretty bomb, but... It's not quite like that. Verse 42 says, uh, and they devoted these new believers and these disciples, these 3,000 new believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That wasn't celebrity preacher, by the way, just so you know. It wasn't like that. Like I get pretty irritated by the celebrity preacher stuff. Uh, It's not like that. Uh, This is the idea that they walked with Jesus, man. (laughs) Like I want to hear. I want to hear. I want to lean in with these guys. Uh, And so... Um, they were walking with Jesus and I want to hear their teaching and their fellowship, their community, the breaking of bread and the prayers. So let me just say, God's plan for you is the same plan it is for me. Uh, It's a growing plan. Uh, We're to be maturing and to be growing. Now, I I am uh, so grateful I'm not where I was in my life, Uh, but true story, I'm nowhere near where I would like to be. Uh, I, uh, yesterday, true transparent moment like I'm I'm always in need of God's grace you know that I'm grateful for his initial grace meeting me where I was and saving me from my sin but I'm in need of his grace every day and yesterday we were unloading our groceries and I tossed a little um, uh, pudding snack to Kale she was organizing the refrigerator in the garage and all the girls were right there and I didn't know that her other hand was full and she didn't catch it and they're all like, oh, dad. And then I replied to them, oh, girls. <laughs> yeah, but it was, that was tamed from what I did. And I basically yelled at them. And that was inappropriate. And uh, I had to go to all of them and, uh, and say I was sorry uh, for what I did and ask for their grace and their forgiveness And they modeled to me what Jesus does to me every single time I blow it. So you know, like your pastor blows it often. Um, I read something this week that I want to pass on to you. All of your spiritual heroes are jerks and sinners. I needed to hear that this week. And uh, you need to hear that today too, that we can't revere people with microphones and pulpits, uh, that they're jerks and sinners just like you and just like me in desperate need of God's grace. And I'm not where I want to be, Uh, but I'm grateful that I'm not where I was and that I am trying to grow and pursue Jesus with everything that I have uh, and I don't want to be an immature follower of Jesus swimming in the kiddie pool of life, splashing around like it's awesome. If you see a 37-year-old man at the kiddie pool at your community pool with floaties on, that's a problem. (laughs) Some of us, it's time for us to take the floaties off, jump off the high dive and get into this thing. Uh, because somebody's calling Child Protective Services on you if you're in that pool. And I'm going to call the Spiritual Child Protective Services on you if we continue to splash around like that. God doesn't want that. God wants us to, to long for something more than what we're just experiencing today. And so one of the ways you can do that on a real practical level, um, and th- th- this is going to sound soapboxy, it's not. Just say it's not, okay? It's not, Okay. But in a culture of, of, of accessibility, I want us to be really, really, really clear. Um, man, I want you to bring your Bible to church. Can I just say that one more time? I want you to bring your Bible to church. I know you got a digital Bible. Listen, can you just do this? If you got your Bible, hold it in the air. Let me see it. Hold it in the air. Okay, now, put it down. That's amen. Okay, I see, I see you, Ed. Don't be offended with what I'm about to say. Nothing wrong with a digital Bible. Everybody say that, nothing wrong. But the reason that that was given to you and to me as a gift from the creators of like you version and other things is accessibility in a pinch. It's about accessibility in a pinch. Man, you read something, oh, I need to, I don't have this with me. Now I take my Bible to work every day, that's a good thing. Uh, but not a, you, you guys don't necessarily do that. Uh, and I, that's okay, I'm not, I'm not mad about that. But when we come here, um, I want you to see that I'm not making up what I'm saying. And that if, you, if you're opened up to the book of Acts, now in my particular Bible, it's page 1124 and 1125, you get the beauty 
of three different, actually, yeah, three different chapters. You get the beauty of context within what we're talking about. So when you look at this, you'll go, oh, wow, this is, this is Peter right here uh, talking about the coming Holy Spirit, preaching at Pentecost. We're, he's about to heal somebody. Uh, he's gonna be preaching at this. What's a portico? Man, I wanna know what a portico is. And then it's uh, before the, I mean, you get to see the passage in context. So that's, that's one element of why you should bring your Bible and you should see that where I'm not making these points up. And uh, there will come a day where that won't be on the screen anymore. I'm doing that out of help to you and transitioning and bridging, but I want you to see it. There'll come a day where there'll be a Bible in a chair in front of you because I want you to see that this is in God's word. It's not my word that I made up. It's God's word that, I'm, that he has used and using me to reveal it to you. And then here's another thing that I think is super important. Uh, when you're uh, hearing a sermon, uh, I'll just open up to Exodus 39, let's just say. Don't do this. Uh, but when you're hearing a sermon, and you're hearing a sermon preached, what you should do, I'm just teaching you for right now. Is that okay? Can I teach you for a second instead of preaching to you? <coughs> what you should do, now this is my system. Squiggly straights, squirrels, uh, circles, squares, not squirrels, uh, lines, and colors. It means something to me. It doesn't mean anything to you, but it means something to me. Uh, and so uh, for me, pink means I know the definition of that term in the original language. I jot it down in the margin of the Bible. That's my thing, not your thing. That's my thing. Circles, those are key points that I wanna make sure that I remember. And then what I like to do is draw in pencil arrows to other passages and other key references on that page. You can't do that on your phone, man. You can't do that on your phone. If you can do that on your phone, that's pretty amazing. But I'm pretty sure you can't do that. And when you're studying God's word, you wanna see that. And what you're doing is you're cataloging your spiritual growth so that one day when you're in heaven and your kid picks up your Bible off of their, your bookshelf, they can see what the Lord has taught your dad in 2009, what the Lord taught mom in 1998, what the Lord taught grandma. And I have a Bible from my grandmother who's now having a party in heaven today with Jesus. And she's been doing it for about 15 years now. And I have her Bible on one of my bookshelves and I can go back there and see what Dr. Melvin Jones said in Muskogee, Oklahoma in 1974. And there's power in that. And you're logging your spiritual journey. Now, the other side of this is, so bring your Bible, lean in, and uh, I'm proud of you for doing that. And um, again, when you're in a pinch, leverage your digital Bible, but you can't get all of that when you've got this right here. Now, another thing too is personal study. That's how we grow. So you bring your Bible, lean in with the spirit of humility in this room and sit under the authority of God's word, not my authority, but under the authority of God's word, and learn from him. But then secondly is practically. Like you gotta pick this sucker up during the week, guys. If all you're doing is eating on, imagine if all you ever did was eat on Sunday, physically. I know intermittent fasting is kind of a thing now in our culture, in the health culture, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about eating every day. And some of you don't know where to start and that's okay. Every page is good. I know Leviticus is hard. I'm heading into that Monday. It's gonna be tough. I'm telling you right now, tell, reading the law every day, really? That's not exciting for me, uh, but it matters. And really what the law is established for God, by the way, is about relationship. I'm putting this so that you know how to deal with one another, you know how to deal with people, you know how to deal with a community of believers that are in the wilderness for a long time. And that's why God gave us this law. So I'm gonna read from that perspective, but there's all kinds of stuff in personal Bible study. I would encourage you to go to John and just start reading because we're gonna do seven significant statements in the Gospel of John as we lead up to Easter. And so if you just start reading the Gospel of John this week, then you'll be able to track with us. Personal Bible study, mentoring is a way to grow. Small groups. This is one thing that I got asked three weeks ago at, a, at our, one of our build sites with Habitat. Hey, when are we gonna do this? We've kind of had them, we kind of not had them as a church, and uh, when are we gonna do this? Well, what you need to know, uh, just so I wanna update you, uh, discipleship matters. Sunday is great, but what happens throughout the week matters more than what happens right now. If you wanna grow in your faith, coming to church is important, but what's gonna happen in a circle is way more, more impactful than what happens in a row. You're in rows right now, and this is a monologue, kind of a dialogue, I want you to participate with me, but conversationally, in the context of a small group, that's when you're gonna see massive growth in your life personally. And so you need to know right now, we're beta testing, testing piloting a specific small group discipleship strategy with about seven or eight groups. 
and they're, they're kind of testing this thing out and right around Easter time, we're gonna get together in a room and we're gonna have a massive feedback session. Hey, does it work? Poke holes in it. How does this look? How do you think our people will receive this? Give me everything you got. And then what I think is gonna happen from all the feedback I'm getting already is that we are gonna have our next step for Sunrise Church as what it looks like to have a discipleship culture and a strategy at our church as we go into the fall. So we're gonna give you a break over the summer. Everybody say amen. Because that's gonna be hard to get started. You never start anything new in the summer, ever. Um, And so back to school time comes around and we'll go full out in launching this discipleship strategy. If we get the feedback, I, I think we're gonna get, okay? So that's a super practical step that we're gonna apply. Number three is, so you got gather, grow, and give. You notice the disciples, uh, in, uh, as they're leading this new church, they push them towards this idea of giving. And it's not really probably what you would imagine it would be. Uh, he says, or uh, well, Luke is the writer of Acts. He documents uh, what happened here. And he said in verse 45, this is what every believer is called to do. Uh, verse 45, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Like, I don't really see that in the modern church very much. I'm just being real with you. But these people were selling all their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all. Now, let me, let me just tell you what that's like in our era. Let me see if I can paint you a picture. That is you right now downsizing, every one of us downsize. I don't care if you live in an apartment, downsizing everything and living a minimalistic life. And all of the stuff that you, all the money you make by selling those on Poshmark, on Facebook Marketplace, in the garage sale, at the estate sale, you are so nudged by the Spirit of God that you take zero cut of that on your own. And you bring that into the family of God, the church, and you bring it together to the leaders and say, here, let's make sure everybody has everything they need. Every single healthcare bill would be taken care of for everybody in the church. No, everybody has groceries. Everybody, their education is taken care of. Like all the practical necessity pieces, like it would be you and me, I'm selling my truck, I'm gonna keep one car. I'm selling my house. We're all gonna live as minimally as we can. That's reasonable. I don't need six TVs in my house. I'm getting rid of the golf clubs. I'm selling the vacation stuff. The timeshare's gone. I have one pair of shoes, one pair of jeans, a couple of different T-shirts. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Are you feeling the weight of that? And, we're, and, and then we bring that in to the church That's what that would have been like in the first century church. That's called unheard of. And really, what I want us to begin to wrap our mind around is that New Testament living, the ethic of the New Testament is counter to the Western ethic that you and I all live. We are so influenced by Rome and we're so influenced by this progressivism, this me-centric that's not gonna be good for me. And really the ethic of the New Testament tears that down and the ethic of the New Testament is communal. It's not me, it's us. It's us. And so with that said, a natural outflow of gathering and growing in your faith, it comes to this space of this idea of being generous and giving. It's seeing what you have is not your own but is God's alone. That was a good spot for an amen. Amen. So what do you give? Two specific things. First one is resources. Now, in my reading of the scriptures in my personal time, I've been, uh, I made it through the book of Acts, or Acts, that's awesome. Uh, I made it through uh, Exodus this last week, and I was blown away several weeks ago in Exodus 11. Don't just jot this down. With regard to resources, check this out. Right before God calls them out 
of Egypt and gives that final plague the, the, um, where uh, the death angel would pass over the houses and the blood that was poured on the doorpost. He would save those people. And if you didn't have the blood on the doorpost, then you lost your kid. Like that's just the way it was. And, um, but check, the, I never caught this until a couple weeks ago. In Exodus 11, the Bible says, the Lord said to Moses, verse one, yet one more plague I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Check this out. Speak now, verse two, in, in, in the hearing of the people. So I want you to speak to where everybody can hear you, that they ask, so the nation of Israel, you're going to ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and for gold. So every person, go to your neighbors, go to your, they were slaves, go to your slave owners and ask them for silver and ask them for gold. Ask them for the precious metals. Now I don't understand this. Two million people are about, in, 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 in a night, are gonna be sent out into the wilderness, gonna cross the Red Sea, and they're gonna have now these jewels and these fine precious metals from the land of Egypt. Why would God ask them to bring that extra weight on? Here's why. Chapter 25, verse one, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution, an offering that they would give from every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution from me. Here's the contribution, this is amazing. As this is the contribution that they, that they shall receive from them, gold, silver, bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for lamps, spices for anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for setting, for the ephod and for the breastplate. Why would they be doing this? Verse eight, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. The reason that God called them to go to their neighbors and ask for resources that they didn't have was so that Israel would realize that what you are given is not yours. You are just simply a buck passer. You are taking that which is not yours and you're now a tool to then be a conduit to give those resources. You're going, you're going to carry them for a while, but then as your heart is inclined, as your heart is moved, you are now responsible for the building campaign of the nation of Israel. And I am going to build a sanctuary to be among the people where God's presence would fall. He was building a tabernacle with ornate gold and bronze and silver and precious metals and rubies and acacia wood and all this stuff that their Egyptian slave owners would have given them, they now passed that on and God leveraged those resources to build a sanctuary. And loved ones, in the same way what God has given you, the gold, the silver, the bronze, it's not yours. It's not yours. The Bible says that every good and perfect thing comes from the Father from above. And he is a giver of good gifts. Those are gifts and you and me are like Israel. And we are simply holding something that someone else gave us. And our job is to leverage those resources to the best of our ability and bring them to the sanctuary to build God's dwelling place. And some of us need to get into that quickly. And I'm not gonna coax you and I'm not gonna twist your arm and I'm not gonna shove you into a corner and say, you ought to be given this and you ought to be given that. What I'm saying to you is that out of a growing, loving relationship with Christ, a disciple gives. And so if your heart isn't there today, ask yourself this question, am I a disciple? And might I say that the nation of Israel, when they gave that gold and that bronze and that silver, I'm sure that stung a little bit. If giving doesn't involve sacrifice, then it's not giving, it's tipping. Can I have an honest moment with you? I like to tip 10%. 
at restaurants. And Joy always calls me cheap. And recently, the Lord has kind of come onto my heart and said, you should be generous in all things. So we were at a restaurant the other night, and I didn't do 10%. I gave a tip at the level which I had to go, man, I'm not comfortable with that. Regardless of their service. And I would just argue that if it's easy for you to just write the check, to click the button, maybe it's really not giving then. Maybe it's just tipping. So we give of our resources. Number two, we give of our time. We give of our time. They were selling their possessions, and then what's interesting is, is that takes time, but then they distributed the proceeds. So really, at the end of the day, this is, can I, can I give you a little bit um, about giving? Just, I wanted to be really clear. I skipped over this. On the back of your bulletin, time, I'll get to that in a second. On the back of your bulletin, there's a ministry dashboard at the very bottom right side. We put that in there every week. Can, now, now let me, there are two ways of doing budgets, just so you know. Uh, right now, on the back of that, you got the hard way. Uh, I'm going to give you the easy way, and we're moving towards the easy way. A lot of churches like to do this because it's hard to swallow the pill. Um, they do budgeting uh, by percentage, so that at the beginning of the year, your budget uh, giving is usually smaller, and it grows in, you know, percentage-wise. Uh, towards the end of the year, the budget percentage just grows. Um, simple math. Are you ready for simple math? I'm a simple guy, so here's simple math. Our budget for 2019 is $640,000, Okay. That's our budget to do Sunrise Church. Is, now what you need to know is that's not massively increased. Uh, you've never paid a senior pastor before uh, and so that includes uh, my salary and benefits um, and then it includes a few other little ministry area places that we had to make minor increases uh, and that's really about it. And so, uh, and so some of it is a little bit of payroll that we had to include that wasn't included last year uh, that we wound up having to just do it anyway because it wasn't included. And so that includes that, my salary, and then some ministry increases as well. But it wasn't very much uh, with regard to last year. We were in the mid-fives uh, last year as well. Um, so that gives you a little bit of uh, kind of context. Now here's what you need to know. If you take 640, divide that by 52 weeks, that lets you know what you need every single week here at Sunrise Church to make budget. That's $12,307, I think, um, right in that mar uh, area and some change. And so that's what it takes. It takes every one of us to get that though. Like not one person is floating that, y'all. Like that's all of us coming together and we're all contributing to that uh, so that uh, we're all bringing uh, into the sanctuary, building God's kingdom. And it takes all of us to be able to do that. So you need to know that that's there on the back of your bulletin as a way of transparency, you knowing. Um, and then that's what we're going after uh, in 2019 is 640 uh, for the year. And so if you look, you should see a difference of uh, we are basically 12 grand behind. Now, I'm not mad about that. You wanna know why? Because two weeks already were a complete flush job uh, in January with, uh, I've never been in ministry before where you had two Sundays. Uh, was it was back to back, wasn't it? Uh, with icy uh, roads where literally about that section came to church uh, and uh, because we kept having church. So uh, that, I'm pretty excited about that. That's not that bad uh, and we'll catch that up. I'm not really nervous about that. But um, anyway, I wanted you to know that uh, as we move forward. Time, uh, serving in time. Uh, that's serving right here in our church. Uh, this room has a spot, uh, this church has a spot for everyone in this room to be involved. How might you wanna serve of your time, give of your time? Uh, I, I don't have time to go through this, but we have a prayer team that's functioning now a little bit more like a care team uh, where we're uh, engaging people with hospital stuff. Uh, we have a prayer team that will pray at, in front of this uh, altar at the end of our service today. You can jump on that. There's prayer requests that get sent out every week. Man, you can join the cafe team. You can build lattes for Jesus, man. Uh, you, can do, you can work on our guest services team. And uh, man, some of us don't realize, oh, I, it's holding a door, it's passing out a bulletin. You, first, let's get off the high horse for a second. Number one, the guest services team is the most welcoming thing you could be a part of that helps tear down hostile walls that allow people to hear the message of the gospel. And so your warm welcome, your handshake, your hug of a neck, uh, it matters. 
Uh, and so you need to hear that from my heart to yours. So it's not just doing just a bulletin. Uh, don't ever say that. I don't ever want to hear anybody say that ever again uh, because that's not right. Like that's downplaying that role. That's important. We have a team. We used to call family ministry. We're transitioning it to call next gen ministry. It's the next generation ministry. I think you can figure out where we're going with that. That's preschool, children's ministry, and student ministry, and it also involves college. There's so many seats on the bus uh, with that ministry that you can get plugged into. One thing we never talk about, by the way, we should talk about this more often, is during the week, clerical office administrative help. If you've got the freedom and the ability to do that, that's a way for you to serve Jesus while you're serving us because that takes a credit card report off of somebody's desk that maybe you can help with coding or maybe you can help with ordering some supplies. It takes that stuff so that we can do uh, the things that, God re- that we're really gifted to do even though that's something we have to do uh, right now. Maybe you love doing that kind of stuff. Um, and I know I'm, I'm, I've exhausted a few options. There's a million other. Don't let the end of the list cuff you from not getting involved. There are plenty of other ways you can get plugged in. And if you're looking for ways to do that, you can hit the Connection Center afterward as well. Or you can message us on Facebook as well if you are listening today. Lastly, uh, what every believer is charged to do is go. So gather, grow, give, um, and to go. Verse 47 says that they praise God and they had favor with all the people. So as this new church uh, lived out their practices of gathering, growing, and giving, it spilled over into a, a desire for others to experience what they were experiencing within their community. They wanted other people to experience this, and God actually let that happen. They actually began to get favor with people. This was the, the uh, real initial kind of birthing phase of Love Month that you just heard about. It started with us wanting people to experience what we have been experiencing here at our church and getting it outside of these four walls. It's awesome. Our services have been incredible over the last several months and God has been moving in a powerful way and we wanted to get some of that energy out into our city. And so uh, we decided to come up with an idea uh, like Love Month and serve uh, four particular weeks in February and we had a goal of mobilizing 100 volunteers at sunrise now i'll tell you this i had a meeting a couple weeks ago uh with somebody and i uh, just being candid with you i really probably overshare just so y'all know uh but um i sat in the room and i said man i'm kind of disappointed uh, because we, we we weren't on, on track to hit it we were not on track to hit that and i was like man i really thought our people i mean they clapped when we first talked about this and we're gonna do this it's gonna be great and uh, we just weren't showing up and then uh, my pessimism got the better side of me when Allison told me that we hit the goal of mobilizing 100 people uh, for service. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, again, my pessimism got the better side of me, but God, really, you did it. And we served over really 600 people. It's really more than that when you count our backpacks. But with the several hundred people that came to Warriors, a guy got saved that night when we were there. Praise God for that. And then, yeah, definitely getting to connect with the three different homeowners at Habitat for Humanity and then uh, with the Ronald McDonald House last week and understanding that there might be even more opportunity there in the future. That's just the beginning and we served to get what we're experiencing here outside of these walls. Now, what I want to nudge you towards is if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, do not depend on the organization of the church to plan for you a love month. That sounds like I kind of slapped you a little bit. I didn't mean it like that. But what I meant was we should provide on-ramps. I'm all for on-ramps and I'm all for, hey, I, I, I don't even think this way. I haven't thought this way before, so let me engage with that. I'm all for that. But what I don't want is I don't want you and I don't want our church to be the splashing around in the kiddie pool, look what everybody organized for me, look how we're all excited about it, and we never get into the game. And the game is to go and to open your eyes. And what I'm excited about is that last week, you know, or yesterday, we had people again going to our backpack ministry, over 20 people packing backpacks yesterday. I loved seeing people on their own going back to Kingdom Warriors without us even organizing it and just showing up 
And so what you have to see and what I have to see is that a disciple, a behavior we embrace is that every morning when you wake, uh, wake up and wipe the sleep out of your eye before you turn the hot water on in the shower, you put on the spectacles of a missionary and you look through the lenses of your life and you are a missionary, you're a goer. And if we don't see ministry like that every single day, we're not disciples, flat out. And so yes, we should organize some things and the church should create on-ramps for that, but you ultimately don't need the church to go do mission work in our city. You don't need me to do that. You don't need anybody to do that. The motivation alone is in the Great Commission. And if we take this seriously, and if we believe that hell is real and it's hot and it's forever, then we should be every day looking through the lenses of a missionary as God would see them, to see people the way God would see them, and to leverage our influence for the witness of the gospel in their lives. And so, should we do Love Month? Voting by, interpreta- by, by hand raising, should we do that? Absolutely we should do that. But should we wake up every day with intentional focus to be missionaries where God has placed us? All the more yes. So then your life and my life and our lives lived for the glory of God will actually be for the good of others. And we will be the evangelistic event that everybody needs. Now what's interesting is that when we learn from this early church When we actually put this stuff into practice, we learn what we talked about last week from Tim Keller is that we actually have relational equity with people. What that means is that what we preach actually matches up with what we do in real life. It's the gospel on the ground. It makes sense. I see it transforming your heart and it's now transforming our hearts and it's transforming our city. What begins to happen is that we get favor with people everywhere we go. The reason some of us don't have favor where we're going with regard to the gospel and many churches don't have favor with regard to the gospel is because we're not living it. And so we wanna be a people that live it and then when we live it, favor follows and check out what happens in verse 47. Verse 47b says that the Lord added their number daily or day by day those who are being saved. Day by day, God added them. Day by day. Why? Why? because they prioritize gathering, growing, giving, and going. They prioritize gathering, growing, giving, and going. And they were being saved. Like it wasn't like they were just attracted to the church. They were saved. They were attracted to Jesus. They weren't attracted to a mechanism. They were attracted to a a man. They were attracted to Christ. And the disciples preached that gospel and they got them into the gathering, taught them how to grow in their faith, taught them how to be generous with what they were doing and then released them as missionaries into the world again every single week. And as I read that, and I read this passage and I've read that several times, I can't just help, I can't help myself but saying, why not our church? Like why not us? Like why not why not with you and me? And why not our city? Like why, why does it have to happen at another church? Why can't it happen with our church? Like why can't it happen right now? Not like tomorrow, but right now. And why can't it happen with us? I just want so bad for us to rally around and build our lives upon these behaviors and, and learn those theological uh, you know, di- di- distinctives, if you will, and wrap ourselves around these philosophical anchors that we've talked about, and then give ourselves, brand ourselves with these four Gs, and live these things out, and they become like this furnace in our soul. It's the fuel to the fire, and we begin to burn. And what I know is that when you and I begin to burn, people come and watch us as we are set on fire. God, you are a very good God, and we are grateful for your word today. And uh, God, as we kind of put this stuff, uh, you know, we're not putting it down, but I mean, we're putting it down in the sense of uh, we're not preaching about it next week. And so God, as we kind of turn this corner, I would just ask that these things would be seared on our hearts. And I would ask God that these things would be transformative in our ministry and that we would build our lives on the concepts of gathering, growing, giving, and going. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around today. Listen, I, I wouldn't want to give you, I wouldn't want to move forward without giving you an opportunity, two opportunities. Number one, 
I, think, I, I do believe there might be somebody here today who has never professed their faith and trust in Christ. And what's so cool is what Jesus did for you. Before the foundation of the world, he knew that you needed a place to gather, a place to grow, a place to give of your resources and of your talents and a place to release you and train you up. And you'd never have access to it if you didn't have Jesus as the sinless son of God. And he lived a perfect life so that you and I in our imperfection by our express faith in him can be saved. If you've never placed your faith and your trust in Christ today, I'd like to just give you an opportunity to do that. And what we like to do here at Sunrise is just simply raise your hand and say, I've never received Christ. And today I wanna receive him into my life. And would you just raise your hand if that's you today? You've never received Christ, you've never trusted him, but you wanna receive him today. Would you raise your hand? I wanna make sure I see you. Maybe you're wrestling with that decision and that's totally fine and we're gonna trust God with that. But others of you, how many of you, if you're honest, you're a, bo- you're a believer, you love Jesus, but maybe, maybe you've been dating the church for a while and your commitment level has been that of, yeah, we're kind of dating. And maybe now today you realize, hey, you know what, Aaron, I really... I need to marry the church. I need to put a ring on her finger. I need to commit and I need to be all in with the church. And I feel like God might be calling me here to do that at sunrise. How many of you would just say, I've been dating the church, but it's time to marry the church in my commitment. Would you just raise your hand? I wanna pray for you in your honesty. Hands, man, there are hands everywhere. Keep, Keep them up. Just raise them up as that's surrender. It's just surrendering. That's all it is. Thank you. Thank you. God, thank you for this openness and this honesty and I just believe truly that there are people probably that just didn't want to raise their hand but God I would just pray that we would sense the 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 drawing of your spirit to to commit to your church if not this church a church somewhere where they can be all in and God we just want to do is we want to do what's pleasing to you and so we we know that your early church gave themselves to these behaviors and we want to be that So teach us how to do this really, really well. Father, thank you for your word today. In Christ's name, amen.